early 1990s. Now, Brian Kennedy, Nick Ostriaco deserve a lot of credit. In 1994, just as I was coming to the US from Sydney, Australia, they put out a paper in Cell that said that the SIR4 gene, SIR standing for Silent Information Regulator, information is important in that acronym, they are that mutant in a yeast cell was able to extend lifespan. And what then we showed with Brian and uh, published a paper shortly thereafter when I got to the lab was that the reason you get this protection from, from aging and longer lifespan uh, is associated with and because there's a relocalization of the SIR protein complex away from silent loci, such as these mating type loci and telomeres. These are heterochromatic. And they move to a site of genome instability, which in yeast um, and in our cells, but in yeast, we studied it. It's the ribosomal DNA. And the ribosomal DNA is very repetitive, about 150 copies end on head to tail. And we could see them move there. And we could mimic this effect by just breaking the chromosome really anywhere we wanted to. And we saw the most of the SIRS complex move to the break. And that included the protein called SIR2, which gave rise to the family of sir 2 proteins. Now, sir 2 I'm not going to talk about uh, much more again. Uh, I just want to tell you that they control heterochromatin, we know, because they, they take NAD as a co-substrate molecule, uh, which is changing during levels during aging and in response to what animals eat. Um, and then they deacetylate histones to compact that chromatin. We also had a look at what happens during aging in a mammalian cell. Is there something like this going on? In other words, do sirtuins, which are, have very specific places at about 400 silent genes and repetitive DNAs in mammals, including transposons as well, retrotransposons, do they move during aging? And can we promote their movement by creating a DNA double-stranded break? Um, and it was, it's actually known that chromatin reorganizes in a quite dramatic way in response to double-stranded breaks. But what isn't known is what happens to the rest of the genome? Does it affect heterochromatin? Does it affect the epigenome? And are there permanent changes after the repair has happened, even if there's no mutation left behind? And so uh, this is the concept that in a young cell, you have this pattern of loops uh, and bundles that control gene expression. If we create a break in the chromosome of a mammal, will we get relocalization of those proteins to the break? Yeast says yes, we had to test it. Um, and then over time, if you repeat this, uh, you know, many hundreds of times, and consider that in our 26 trillion cells in our body, this happens at least once per day. So that's a lot of breakage over time do we get this disruption? So we could test that in cells and we could test this in mice, which we did. And this um, was a review that came out. Um, it was in cell by Jan Vai, if you say it correctly. And what he was describing was a study where we created breaks in mammalian culture, uh, mammalian cells and in mice. And we found that the relocalization required these uh, DNA damage checkpoint proteins. So this wasn't just a, a random drift. That, this really was an active process that required phosphorylation, chemical modification of the actual histones at the break. And it's one of the first steps, the movement of SIRT1, which is the homologue of the SIRT2 yeast gene that I talked about. This enzyme uh, gene product, the enzyme moves to the breaks, recruits repair proteins, uh, and then most of it goes back to where it came from. And we could see this also recapitulated during aging, this process of moving away from the SIRT1 regulated promoters. This enzyme was very useful to us. It's been used to, to study DNA break repair for many years in vitro, but we started to use it in vivo. I use it, we use it in our lab because it doesn't cut very often. There's only uh, about 18 consensus sites um, across the genome. It does cut the RDNA, which we had to be very careful, we weren't just trashing the genome. But um, it's been very useful because it, it stimulates a very, very mild damage response. In fact, it's so mild 
you can barely detect any activation of these factors. Um, by a Western blot, you won't see P53 activated, for example. It's, we call it chromosome tickling to distinguish it from other types of studies.